Estamos en el segundo foro internacional, la innovación en la justicia, organizado por México Evalúa y la Fundación Friedrich Naumann para la Libertad. Les invitamos a interactuar a través del sitio de internet oficial del foro, innovacionenlajusticia.mexicoevalúa.org, así como a través de las redes sociales oficiales de México Evalúa, en Facebook, Twitter, Instagram y la transmisión a través del canal de YouTube. Utilizando el hashtag Innovando la Justicia. Pueden conocer más sobre nuestras y nuestros panelistas en el sitio oficial del foro innovacionenlajusticia.mexicovalua.org. Vamos a continuar con el programa del día de hoy. Tendremos a continuación el panel titulado Justicia de Género, Innovaciones e Impunidad quien lo va a moderar, Fátima López, directora de la Red de Abogadas Violeta en México, y donde participará Lía Marrieta, directora de País de Abogados y Fronteras en Canadá, from, uh, Michelle and Reyes Milk, Canada, consultora de la Iniciativa de Mujeres Milk, para la Justicia de Género of the Women's Initiative for Gender de Colombia, Justice, for Colombia, y Rocío Villanueva Flores, de Cana de la Universidad de Colombia. Y Rocío Villanueva Flores, Of en este panel se abordarán las oportunidades de la innovación Peru. para construir condiciones más igualitarias para las mujeres. We are here to build more equal conditions for women. Así como los retos y avances para la justicia de género en los que ha habido en los últimos dos años. Le doy la palabra a Fátima Now, López, give the floor directora de la red de abogados. Fátima López. Bienvenida. Welcome. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. For me, it's a, a pride to be in this panel, being able to moderate uh, uh, with uh, such uh, panelists from many countries, the Lilia Marietta, Michelle Reyes, Rosan. Thank you very much for being with uh, us today because we are going to be addressing an important topic, gender and justice. As I was getting ready for this presentation and the moderation of this panel, I had the opportunity to go through some documents that I happen to find very important to discuss as the initial part of what we're going to be saying today. And uh, as uh, UN Women, uh, Mamlu Manuka issued uh, this, uh, if you subject yourself to a test of uh, COVID-19, the virus, nobody will ask you what you were wearing when you were infected or whether you were uh, drinking alcohol. You are sure that your test will be examined in a lab and that uh, reasonable likelihood uh, that you will receive uh, health care. The response will not depend on you being believed. You will not feel such a level of environment that uh, could impede you from uh, looking for help. You will receive uh, assistance and support, a treatment that we know that does not uh, happen uh, towards the uh, women that have uh, uh, suffered any sort of aggressions. For me, it's important to start the panel in this way so we can think about the way in which we can uh, create new ways uh, to have a social justice for women and for it not to be any longer uh, a privilege. And the fingers that we were analyzing before the presentation allowed us to see that all the way up to March 2020, when you can, which is the date to which you can uh, find official, we have 20 million people infected and 2.6 million uh, deaths. During 2019, according to UN Women data, 243 million women and uh, girls uh, suffered uh, sexual violence or physical uh, violence by their partners. So we have seen in several uh, panels of that violence, gender violence is the other pandemic, the shadow pandemic, as it was said, we are living and undergoing in many ways and many forms of violence that have increased in the pandemic and have uh, made justice to become a risky situation for women. In many courts around uh, the country and the world, uh, people were saying that there were different criteria to justify uh, uh, the uh, 
appear, presentially uh, uh, appearings, but I continue to think that uh, these are judicial administrations. Do they continue gender cases as uh, being s- exceptional or urgent? Have uh, they thought about the emergency or the need of a mother so they can help their children? Also, we can help how justice can get in an appropriate way for a uh, divorce case to shorten times uh, under which women we are going and appearing uh, before a jurisdictional entity. We have to wonder about changes in the justice administration that have a gender perspective for the legislation and practices that institutions are currently maintaining stop uh, increasing inequalities just by the mere fact of being a woman or a non-binary person. Personally, I think that it's high time that we turn to see the judicial systems uh, and that we started to think again about new possibilities that can really promote access to justice and guarantee human rights as well as to enforce uh, judicial uh, norms during and after this uh, crisis because access to justice for some women is a matter of life or death and this access cannot be outstanding during uh, the pandemic while we know that we are having outbreaks again all the time we know that uh, justice for women effectively is a uh, a uh, matter of privilege, uh, and uh, we have to think about this again so we can get to uh, go. This uh, event dynamic will be as follows. Each one of our panelists will start speaking for a short period of time, and they will be sharing their opinions about uh, the questions that we're going to be making uh, for them so they can uh, tell us what they consider uh, with re- regards to the topic that we're going to be addressing today and which is a very important one. That's the reason why uh, now I will give the floor to Lilian Arrieta uh, with that. Uh, well, and I will make uh, for this question, which will be the same for the next uh, the two panelists as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The inequality... Uh, the gender inequality gap has been increased. How can innovation help build more equal conditions for women and feminized uh, identity people? Lillian, thank you very much to be with us to share in this panel. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on from where you're listening to us today with the digitalization, we can uh, be uh, watching this panel from uh, any part around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mexico Evalua, for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to uh, meet and meet uh, again uh, women that I admire a lot uh, to discuss about uh, these topics that interest us a lot as can uh, be. Uh, 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 gender-focused justice, because we know that many of the topics, many of the public policies and the exercise of uh, the public function uh, does not affect us uh, in the same way uh, men and women. And for uh, justice uh, to be expeditious and fulfilled as uh, the Salvadorian constitution establishes, it has to be administered with a and with a gender focus, with that uh, differentiating policies, so uh, we can really reach the population groups that need uh, this the most. And as Fatima was saying at the beginning, in fact, uh, I'm going to be uh, speaking about this at the end of uh, my presentation. The shelter pandemic during a COVID-19 pandemic, besides uh, disinformation, which is uh, the third pandemic, was the increase of uh, gender violence, right? So I'm going to divide uh, my uh, presentation up into a part. First of all, poverty, digital uh, gap and gender, and number two, the policy adopted by the judicial entity of El Salvador, so uh, we can try to make uh, justice more accessible. And the third part consists on consists in the, the actual impact that these innovations may have had that were uh, implemented from the judiciary. So I will start by uh, uh, giving a very simple uh, 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 scenario for uh, women because in El Salvador, and I'm sure that in many countries uh, in Latin America, poverty has a a woman's uh, face. And if we see this from a a cross uh, perspective, Poverty has uh, a woman's uh, face. 
uh, who lives in a rural setting and who has a, a, a very impoverished uh, uh, work because uh, she is unemployed because of the pandemic and of times she is the head of her home uh, in which she is the only parent and when she has a partner well they have a, a, a care burden that men do not have this uh, problem of uh, poverty has a uh, direct relevance on what we're analyzing because this uh, relates to uh, the access to digitalization uh, innovation with access to uh, ITs, which are the entry uh, points to many of uh, innovations so that the different judicial entities have tried to implement because of the pandemic that made in many cases, impossible to have uh, uh, on-site uh, and 100% on-site justice in El Salvador, for instance. Uh, the digital gap is uh, greater in a rural setting than in the urban setting. The difference is huge. And when we see this uh, from uh, across the perspective of women, well, there is uh, a broader digital uh, gap for uh, women and just like uh, poverty behaves that's the same the way in which uh, the digital uh, gap behaves and there is a bridge in terms of access to internet and uh, we have uh, even less women in general with access to the uh, internet than a uh, man we have uh, different uh, universities uh, studies uh, international organization studies with uh, 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 their own figures but all of them have uh, this uh, common denominator uh, the judiciary in El Salvador tried to implement some uh, measures during the pandemic to uh, make uh, uh, justice more accessible to uh, people. It allowed for uh, lawsuits to be filed via email, while uh, lawsuits in El Salvador, we do not have a digitalized uh, uh, file yet, so everything has to be on site. You have to go with uh, your bunch of uh, copies, and you have to uh, file your lawsuit on a site at uh, the appropriate court or at uh, the lawsuit uh, receiving uh, secretary. Uh, uh, and or the space where we can uh, file lawsuits and actions. Uh, something that we should try to implement was the possibility uh, by uh, uh, email, but mainly uh, before constitutional uh, justice. And for this, we had to, we had to, uh, all of us who wanted to file a habeas corpus lawsuit, for instance, because uh, be, uh, the relative has been detained with, uh, with all of the extraordinary measures that we have. Uh, that we had to justify so we could uh, move around during uh, the lockdown. We uh, must have had access to a computer or to a, a, a mobile phone. In general, it's a computer while many aspects have been digitalized uh, regarding uh, the filing of the lawsuits. Sometimes it's not about this, uh, about these spaces. That, what are they called? Uh, interoperational spaces or uh, which work uh, likewise, in uh, on different platforms, and I can see this both uh, or as uh, uh, on a computer or on a mobile phone. In here, we we're having an impossibility for women because the access that they have is mainly through mobile phones and not uh, through a computer. So, what if uh, platforms uh, that are intended by the government to administer justice uh, only work for the computer format and not uh, for mobile phone format. We are from the beginning limiting access for women to these benefits that we are looking for through remote, uh, remote access. Likewise, the judiciary of El Salvador implemented uh, hearings. Uh, uh, so, um, that's one of the changes that we made and also we created and we brought into the coverage of electronic notif of the electronic notification system to um, further users and people. So we had uh, an attempt here to uh, bring uh, together that stage of uh, filing and then hearings, uh, uh, digital hearings, but uh, once again, the me implemented mechanisms uh, were rather uh, working uh, better for uh, computer friend to computer friendly uh, formats and not uh, for uh, mobile phones. Now I will um, 
uh, well, I will stop here and I will depend later on in all of this. But I want to tell you that in uh, many spaces in which a woman is a, the woman the woman is living with a partner and has access to a mobile phone with access to a mobile network. In cases of uh, gender violence uh, or uh, aggression, the person in charge of the mobile phone is the partner that is uh, uh, the author of uh, this violence. So access becomes a nominal and not an actual, a non actual access. And that's what, what's missing in El Salvador. We have to measure the impact, the usefulness, the efficacy of uh, the measures that up to now have been adopted to. Uh, bring uh, justice closer to uh, people and the, especially the impact that this has uh, had on women or on people with feminized identities. Thank you very much. Now I will give the floor to the next speaker. Uh, Michelle Reyes, uh, go ahead. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be part of this panel. And of course, uh, the fact that we have uh, Dean Rocio Villanueva here. Thank you very much, Rocio, for being uh, uh, here as well. And uh, Lilia Arieta and Fatima too. I would like to start with a reflection about why at a Women's Initiative for Gender Justice that I represent with this project in Colombia. I am not Colombian, but I am leading the project in this country. Uh, why for us, uh, thinking about a tool uh, like uh, the principles, uh, the, the Hague's principles of uh, gender violence is an innovative tool when uh, we were told uh, that uh, about the presentation of the principles and uh, the way that led us in uh, 2019 to the Hague principles on uh, sexual violence, the deficient, the term of innovation for us in uh, to prepare for uh, this presentation represented an opportunity as well as to think about uh, the principles from uh, this perspective. What uh, makes these principles to be an innovation when we think about a sexual uh, and gender violence? Uh, sexual and gender-based uh, crimes are the most uh, invisible ones. And when survivors mostly uh, uh, poor women decide to uh, bring their cases to justice. We, as we well know, they are uh, they're, they're facing a series of obstacles of prejudices between, uh, well, among uh, justice operations and also how, in terms of how to understand sexual violence at a uh, first uh, uh, state uh, prejudices of how to consider the indices as uh, to consider these uh, acts among many other elements. One of the main challenges has uh, been how to understand sexual violence. What makes a, a sexual act to be a sexual uh, violence crime? And while the departing uh, point for us when we work on the Hague principles of uh, sexual violence was uh, international law and understanding this category of sexual violence as uh, a category within uh, crimes against humanity. Well, we found out uh, that this is a challenge for internal uh, legislations and systems. If you allow me, if you give me two minutes just to uh, describe what the Hague principles of uh, uh, sexual violence are for those who haven't had the opportunity yet to uh, get to know this instrument, this tool. Uh, the Hague Principles of uh, Sexual Violence were launched in uh, December 2019 uh, in The Hague, and they are the product of a series of a project of over two years, uh, together with uh, some research around or uh, uh, with a collection of uh, some of the most important standards of international criminal law. Uh, work was conducted with over, over 500 uh, survivors in several countries focusing on uh, 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 have the content on sexual uh, violence based on the, the experiences and testimonials of uh, these survivors. We started from uh, the realization that uh, there is no generalized vision of uh, what sexual violence uh, means and a uniform consensus that a sexual act becomes a, a sexual violence a crime. While international law 
has uh, and uh, internal regulations. I have uh, several uh, dispositions regulating several acts like uh, sexual violence. There is uh, actually no generalized division, as I was saying, of what constitutes uh, sexual violence or damage experienced in our uniform consensus on this uh, category. We know that when we speak about uh, sexual violence, uh, we usually speak about all uh, uh, violations to integrity, sexual autonomy and integrity, usually this characterized by humiliation in, uh, and destruction, while there are several forms of uh, sexual violence that have been typified both in the international law and uh, internal legislation. Some um, do not uh, find a space within the specific criminal types. For instance, uh, uh, forced uh, marriage, uh, uh, genital mutilation, forced sterilization, just to name a few. And uh, the campaign, which is, uh, uh, well, call it what it is, uh, the quality, the quality of what it is, the campaign tried to collect uh, these experiences to build uh, the Hague principles of uh, sexual violence. And uh, based on uh, three main sections, we have a statement of uh, the civil society, uh, in international criminal law principles, and uh, principles for those uh, responsible uh, for public policies in terms of uh, sexual violence. And it tries to cover the content of uh, this category based as well on the identification of those things that are part of essential elements for uh, the construction of sexual violence and how we can understand consent and how we can analyze some of the uh, indices, uh, what are, uh, what is, um, how we understand the body, what are some of the elements of sexual violence. And now, why is this an innovation for us from the invitation that we received to think about the Hague principles as a, an innovative tool rather than a technological innovation? This is an innovation around to the premise and the statement of uh, focusing a sexual violence category as a category encouraging it to and inviting us to uh, a reflection around all types of sexual violence and based on over 500 survivors we set forth uh, this vision as an innovative one taking into account all of uh, the experiences from the different diversities from the different uh, cultural approaches and uh, we want this uh, from the international regulation but also national and uh, domestic legislation to have a content some uh, dispositions around sexual violence. Uh, we have this uh, like uh, the statement of from and also in some other regulations, for instance, the Colombian uh, Criminal Code that has a disposition, a very interesting disposition, Article 106 of uh, the Criminal Code that uh, regulates uh, those sexual acts uh, that do not uh, include uh, mm, uh, uh, a body um, violent uh, access uh, which uh, can uh, be considered uh, uh, sexual violence. So uh, we have this innovative approach that we consider to be able to uh, bridge the gap of uh, gender inequality, allowing survivors, including women and feminized uh, identities, uh, can have a greater access to justice uh, through a trial but also for a judicial operators to incorporate this uh, broader vision to all forms of sexual violence to open the way up. And in this context, following the statement of the first question, the context of the pandemic, as you know, has uh, exacerbated situations in which uh, these uh, sexual violence acts are uh, committed. And uh, this uh, takes place in a, in a legislative context, uh, uh, which has no specific uh, uh, type in uh, uh, domestic legislation. We can continue reflecting in uh, upon uh, this or in the second uh, segment, but uh, having 13 uh, seconds, I will take this opportunity to, uh, to stop um, here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now I will give the floor to Dean Rosiva Yanova Flores. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Fatima. So I want to thank uh, this uh, invitation and uh, expressing uh, my pleasure to share this panel with uh, Michelle Reyes, my colleague at the law school at uh, the Pontifical Catholic University of Peru. And it's a great pleasure to be with uh, Lilia Marita to share once again a panel on uh, uh, gender uh, justice. I would like to 
um, speak about in this uh, short uh, presentation in, a, in the most succinct possible way, the problem that concerns the impartiality and the reasoning of uh, the magistrates when uh, they solve the cases, uh, especially uh, of sexual violence and uh, the uh, gender stereotypes. I think it's very important when we analyze the judicial decisions in uh, this field to bear in mind the relevance of uh, the relevance of uh, judicial impartiality, which is a principle uh, that uh, explicitly or implicitly protects our constitution and uh, the American constitution on uh, human rights. So therefore, I'm going to divide my presentation uh, up in uh, the judicial impartiality and duty, and uh, then corruption and uh, civil cases. So we can speak about corruption and other of uh, the big pandemics, and it's uh, linked to gender violence. I just uh, want to remind you that the magistrates are responsible for being impartial, and that's uh, their duty, a duty of independence face to the uh, trials uh, parties, and uh, this entails for uh, magistrates not to solve uh, based on prejudices or bias or uh, favoritism. So I was at uh, the Inter-American uh, Court uh, Mm, impartiality demands uh, the measure to approach the cause uh, uh, free of uh, bias, prejudices, and gender stereotypes. When we identify uh, in a, a ju judicial decision a gender stereotype, we have to bear in mind that uh, this stereotype behind which there is a prejudice is not a reason, a valid reason, for a magistrate to uh, uh, justify a decision. And this is very important because uh, those stereotypes oftentimes get to the uh, absolution of uh, uh, the accused, and which is also the topic that is bringing us together today. Law in contemporary uh, democracies protects uh, uh, fundamental um, uh, uh, principles that we have to bring in mind that the law establishes limits and that not all arguments are valid to uh, sustain a judicial uh, decision. And that's why it's very important uh, to take into account the second point, which is the relevance of uh, the judicial argumentation. Today, it's very clear that if as Pietro Sanchez was saying, if the judicial uh, outlook in our legislation changes uh, because of uh, the incorporation of uh, rights in our constitutions, it's uh, in uh, the uh, role of our, uh, it's uh, the argumentations uh, or the judicial reasoning's role, uh, uh, a very important element today. Authorities have to justify their decisions and they have to do this based on a valid uh, and appropriate reasons as to justify a judicial decision or a fiscal decision. And in general, uh, a prosecution decision or a decision by authorities. That's why uh, judicial or illegal reasoning is important in school, in law schools. And we have to teach not just uh, the content of law, but we have to teach to reason legally in such a way that uh, we can uh, uh, be we we can establish uh, or see when a legal decision is uh, uh, objective or subjective or arbitrary uh, contemporary democracies uh, demand uh, objective uh, decisions by our authorities. I cannot stop and see the criteria that have been developed to give our reason an objective character to the judicial decisions. But what I can say, and something that is very clear, is that there are reasons that aren't valid to uh, found a judicial uh, decision, gender stereotypes, Prejudices that decision cannot be based on a pure emotional uh, a reaction, a falsehood, or alien um, ideas of the type. Everybody knows that. Now, this is not enough to justify a judicial decision. However, those of us who devote to the study of gender violence, we see often that in judicial decisions, we incorporate gender stereotypes. 
that I repeat, these are based on prejudice. And when we identify a decision with a stereotype, not only can we say that this decision is ethically questionable, but also we can say that those decisions are judicially incorrect. Why? Because they are violating, in the case of the gender violence examples, they are violating the principle of equality and non-discrimination. And also, which is the objective of this in intervention, the judicial duty of being impartial. A judge that solves using, that rules using a stereotype violates the impartiality principle and that decision is judicially incorrect. I want to mention an example from my country on how these stereotypes can be identified in the judicial decisions. This is the case of a law student that was a victim of rape by the one of the lawyers from the buffet where she was working on, from the firm where she was working on, and she was raped. She wakes up bleeding and she asks that someone takes her to the medical center of the university where she is she receives stitches and she presents the complaint and this is just filed by the district's attorney and she and they said that this delay of 42 days indicated that she was lying this is a case in which this decision expresses a stereotype. This is the stereotype of a lying woman, which brings as a consequence the fact that this process that was just sent to be filed, to be stored, and this constitutional writ of Amparo allowed this procedure to, to move forward. But I want to mention that these stereotype can create negative consequences. And I'm saying that this type of reasoning needs to be paid attention to in order to question it judicially. And since I just have a few questions, I want to leave for my next intervention, the civic cases, gender violence and judicial decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dean. We are going to summarize what we have learned today, what we are analyzing and what we are talking about in order to continue with the next question. In the first part of this exercise, we could see that in Salvador, as well as in other countries in Latin America, there was a search for ways in which these complaints made by women could be done electronically or remotely. However, the same thing happens over and over again. Women that are trying to look for justice remotely is through a cell phone, not through a computer. And in their cell phones, they are also having to check the lectures for their children. And it's not practical. So justice cannot be acknowledged as something that we are looking for, which we need to have is access. And Liliana Rieta mentioned that even if there were some hearings being done remotely, the same thing happened. How is it useful for me to have a remote hearing if we go back to the same point? How am I going to get it? How much time I'm going to dedicate to it? And how much money I will have to invest in it if I don't have a strong network or data, enough data to hold that call, conference call? So this lack of measurement instruments in order to realize the efficiency and access to justice, we get a clear answer. The proper measures are not there in order to have justice for gender that can reach women in these circumstances. And also uh, Dean Michelle Reyes said something very important on the importance of recognizing the principles of sexual violence. All the prejudices that women live just by being victims of these 
crime. The word consent needs to be highlighted because it's fundamental. It seems as if today in the justice centers, in the judiciary, consent, as I, as uh, Dr. Rocio Villanueva mentioned in her explanation on the cases in her country, it is clear that taking 42 years meant that she consented to that, but that's not consent. We need to explain to them what consent is, how it comes to be, and so that they stop having this idea and we can stop these gender stereotypes against women. We need to recognize that sexual violence crimes are one of the worst crimes, and we see this during internal kidnapping. This was an instrument that was done with more than 500 survivors, survivors that were able to provide the content to acknowledge what sexual violence is. When doctor was talking, I remember the rulings of the Inter-American Court, such as Rosenda Cantu or the case in Atenco in Mexico on sexual violence and how we are still trying to have the opportunity to recognize all the ways of violence that women live. And as uh, Dr. Michelle was saying, apparently there is no proper conceptualization of these terms in their countries. And we do not really recognize the severity of these crimes. Finally, in the presentation that we were able to have by Dr. Rocio Villanueva, I want to highlight the transcendence of the first part, the impartiality of judges. This was very important for me because it reminded me of when we started studying about the strategic kits and how the realism in North America unmasked the judicial logic based on which judges started ruling. So there is this work uh, law in the modern mind that the judicial foundations of the just are not done a posteriori. They made their decision because uh, based on personal intuitions. And I thought of this when I was listening to her and I said, we need more strategic reasoning, but especially as well, the most important part of her intervention that I want to mention so that we remember it is that this argumentation best based on gender. We need to recognize stereotypes and we need when we need to recognize that all judges can do this and that argumentation is the basis to understand that we are before something that needs to be established as a suspicious category. And even though we know it in the conventions and even though we have it approved in our countries, we need to be constantly demanding it because we can reach international spaces, but there is another reality that women live every day so that they can have access to justice. I think this panel is very important. And in order to continue with the program that we have, I would like to ask the next, que next question to our panelists. And this is very important. I would like to ask the three of you, what technological or innovative elements socially can facilitate access to justice for women and people who identify as female. Right now, I am going to give the floor to Dean Lilian Arrieta so that she can talk about this. Thank you, Fatima, uh, but I'm not a Dean. I, I am a teacher. I'm just an academic here in the university. I think that the only dean here is Rocio. And I remember that last year when we met for the first time, she was just assigned as the first female dean in this university in Peru. So we were all with this great joy that we were feeling because of that. What... puts one of us in a better place is good for everyone, for all of us. So this is something that we were talking about this. And about your question, Fatima, I also talked a little bit 
about it. In El Salvador, we try to identify technology mechanisms to approach justice for people in general, but maybe here I will emphasize gender violence because I was not able to elaborate on that in the previous presentation, but even though the largest part of women in El Salvador that have access to a mo mobile network and to a device that they can use to go online, when they are being victims of gender violence, they lose control of these type of devices that allow them to be connected. So this is a situation that is very dangerous and damaging for women because especially during the pandemic in the lockdown, we saw that the figures of gender violence increased a lot in many places of the world. And even in El Salvador, in the Conservatory Against Gender Violence, we saw that gender violence increased in a 70% during the first three months of the pandemic. In El Salvador, the figures of gender violence are one of the largest in the world. We have the second rate, uh, the second highest rate of homicides in the world. And the domestic violence figures are also really, really high. So we had this phenomenon that was produced in many places that the victims were locked down with the abusers because many times we know that as statistics show us, the main perpetrator is someone around the environment of women. It may be domestic violence and even sexual violence, what Michelle was talking about, is given many times within the close environment to these women, women whether it is at work, whether, whether it is in a university, at school, or at home. So technology by itself does not solve the problem. We can try to look for a solution or we can try to innovate with different mechanisms and different instruments or devices. But if we do not see the impact, first of all, to see if measures are being enough and we measure it with a gender lens, which is this different idea through which we need to see the impact of these measures because the main victims of gender violence are women and people that identify as female. And in El Salvador, they are also part of the rates of gender violence and even more cruel, type, cruel types of violence even under the hands of the law enforcement. There are being some accusations, there have been some accusations against the police officers as well. So technology innovations are not really useful if women do not have power or control over that device that allows them to have access to technology information. So we need to look for alternatives. Also, during the pandemic, a lot of emergency lines were established, phone lines. Once again, we need to have access to a phone that did not require to have a balance in, in the line. And this is also a positive measure. They also needed to have a phone. They only needed to have a phone and they could place a call. But here, maybe we need to start thinking out of the box and we need to realize that technology itself, even though it is a symbol of innovation, it does not solve the problem of access to justice for women. And it does not solve especially the problem of access to justice of gender violence victims whose figures have increased significantly. And I want to say to finish up that in El Salvador, the figures of gender violence increased in the percentages that I mentioned, but global complaints does not go beyond 6%. The amount of victims of gender violence that actually place a claim against this gender violence is around 6%. So these 
people sometimes say, why do not they do they not say anything? But we need to cross this information between access to technology and the lack of access so that we need to think out of the box to see how women can have access to justice, especially gender violence victims that are being locked down with their abusers during large amount of times. And they need to have some sort of support so that they can have access to justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lilian. And right now I will give the floor to Michelle Reyes so that she can tell us her comments about this question. Thank you very much, Fatima. I want to take two reflections that both uh, Lilian and Rocio made. Rocio is a dean. I'm not a dean either, but well, two main ideas. The first one by Lilian, how technology by its, itself does not solve the problem. And the other one by Rocio, regarding stereotypes and gender prejudices. This second reflection is something that was in the core of the implementation of the Hay Principles on gender violence, sexual violence. We had something last year with the judge, judges of the nation's uh, district attorney's offices we consider then that some of the innovative elements socially and some of the innovative elements of the high principles on sexual violence are also looking to create a reflection around the existing prejudices in the society. They are trying to create dialogue spaces and with the justice operators that allow to address the different prejudices that are within the structures of our judicial areas. And some of these principles are also opening the roads to a better acceptance and maintenance of all the ways of sexual violence. These hay principles also set tools around these prejudices and these stereotypes. For instance, stereotypes around the victims and the characteristics of victims. Rocio mentioned a, an example around the obstacles in Peru to receive a complaint around this crime that was committed 42 days before the complaint was filed. And we see these stereotypes as well that take into account, unfortunately, the perception and the prejudice about the characteristics of the victim. For instance, and this is just an example that was given in Peru. This was a woman that liked to be very social. And that was the argument of the just when he ruled out this sexual violence case, but also a lot of stereotypes around very limited understanding on if, for instance, penetration is required for it to be considered sexual violence or physical touch as well. So these hey principles on sexual violence address some of these elements. They address the nature of the acts themselves to establish that these include unique, multiple, continuous, or intermittent actions that in context are perceived as actions of sexual violence. They also address consent to understand that sexual violence can be performed in a forced way, but also against a person that is not able to give consent in a free, voluntary, specific, and continuous way around the characteristics of the victim. They also highlight sexual violence as Lilian has mentioned in a very good way. They can be committed by any person against any person, but also in different contexts, such as environments with the partner, with the family or in intimate environments. So we have diverse 
environments. Physical contact is one of the main obstacles when addressing this sexual violence topic. For instance, let's think about some uh, different cases on how to, for instance, forcing someone to see pornographic acts or to masturbate someone else. So all of these constitute sexual violence themselves, and especially if they are in different contexts, as well as other elements that help us understand in a better way, what are some of the obstacles that can be faced when presenting a complain regarding sexual violence, but also to have an argument or a foundation of this nature. Some, when socializing the principles of sexual violence last year, the operators of justice in Colombia, they were asked if they could fill in a survey before this meeting, an anonymous survey and the objective was that to be able to identify some of the prejudices or the stereotypes in their argumentations and the results were very interesting we had results such as if they had sexual satisfaction the victim had sexual satisfaction then these possibility of moving forward with this complaint on sexual violence was dismissed. If there is no contact, physical contact, also there was no possibility of following, following this road. Therefore, we consider that the element of the stereotype added to the structures in these organizations constitute an obstacle for the implementation, but also for the integrity of judicialization of this sexual violence topic. And now I give the floor to Dean. I'm sorry, I think I lost my connection. I apologize. I want to start this intervention by quoting Jerome Frank, this famous person that talks about the judicial clinics and he established that the law school should, should be worried about these factors that made the values that should be protected are not able to be complied. And in the case of Peru, these factors that stop the compliance of the concepts of equality are related to judicial corruption and inequality. And that's why I also talk about this corruption. Peru is a country that is affected with this judicial corruption issue. And that's why this is a case category. The civic cases, standard theory and judicial argumentation separates easy and difficult cases depending on the difficulty that these cases may originate. But I consider that the judicial systems or the justice systems in corruption should be attributed to those whose foundation is based on unreasonable concepts. And these type of examples we see it are seen in some of the decisions of, of gender violence that allows us to suspect a link between the use of stereotypes that I also consider that are being used because it is so normalized that they, can, they consider that they can be accused without having any consequences, as well as cases of a judicial corruption Consequence. This is the link that I have tried to establish in some cases with these 
unreasonable foundations. For instance, in October last year, during the pandemic, a court in one of the departments at the south of Lima absolved one of the accused persons for rape. And one of the arguments that they established is that since the victim had a, an underwear that was red and had lace, the use of that underwear meant that the victim had had consented sexual intercourse and therefore it was not possible to establish that she had been a victim of sexual assault. And as there was also a, an expert decision that the victim was shy, they also said that if she used this type of underwear, she could not be shy. She was a woman that had decided to use that underwear in order to have sexual intercourse with consent. And that was one of the elements or the arguments that these judge used to absolve the accused. That's why I reinforce the importance of analyzing the argumentations under which rapists are being absolved because these argumentations are not compatible with the right, with the law by affecting these type of principles. And these are scenic argumentations. And that's why I am focusing on this because these argumentations are so unreasonable that when they are used by the Supreme Court in a ruling that is signed by unanimity, they at least should allow us to be to feel suspicious of that there is a link with corruption. But since they since proving a crime like this can be very difficult, what it is important to say is that using these stereotype-based argumentations is violating this impartiality principle. And within these principles, with this argumentation of this uh, lack of impartiality can give disciplinary sanctions to judges also as a way of fighting the use of stereotypes that brings as a consequence impunity. And in a clearer way, that's what we can see in the cases of sexual violence. That's why I insist in the importance of studying the judicial argumentation in order to question with these judicial or legal foundations, these stereotype-based decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dean, for your contributions. Since we have just a few minutes, it is very important for us that you give us a summary in one minute on how we can guarantee access to justice with a gender perspective. Let's imagine that you are going to write a tweet in 140 uh, characters. I will give you the floor right now. Dr. Liliana, you can start. I feel embarrassed and of the fact that we are still discussing this topic because male and female judges are still using these gender stereotypes when ruling on a case of gender violence. We may have the best laws. And in El Salvador, we have a specific law for a life free of violence for women. We have specialized courts and we have these criminal cases, and we are still seeing the typical cases of the judges that apply stereotype-based justice, and they put the load of blame on the victim. And as Rocio mentioned, in their mind, they have done, they have made a decision before that, and then they create the decision in order to reach this ruling that is full of their own prejudices. So we need good laws, yes, obviously, 
But what we also need is to rip off those prejudices to this patriarchal justice so that the victim that the victims and the different types of violence for may have a true access to justice in an impartial way, as Rocio has mentioned, because that's the only justice available. If it's not impartial, it's not justice. It may be something else, but not justice. Thank you very much. Thank you, lawyer Michelle, if you may, please. Thank you, Fatima. Well, I need to think of it like a tweet. So I think that innovation needs to be done by addressing these stereotypes, not only in the society and not only in the operators of justice, including the argumentations that they use, but also the criminal cases and the employment of these resources in order to establish good rulings for this type of acts. Thank you very much. And just to close, if Dean Rocio Villanueva can give us a few words. Well, as if it was a tweet, I'm going to say this. Objective judicial decisions that are impartial that include exclude gender stereotypes. Gender stereotypes are not reasons that are given in the law in our contemporary democracies. Thank you very much. For us, it's been a privilege to have you here. Thank you all. I would like to close and by summarizing, it is really, really bad that we still need to continue talking about this. For me, it's very important to think about how we can do to make people understand the transcendence of sexual violence and all the people that are going through this type of crimes that increased during the pandemic and that we saw that they reached really, really high points all over Latin America. And as Dr. Rocio said, I want to say something, justice without impartiality may be anything but justice. We need to reestablish these cases with cynicism, because that's the word, how this argumentation is still reproducing these gender stereotypes that make justice for women a privilege. And this is a very difficult access for us. And we are talking about different regions and centralized spaces in each country. And just for everyone to reflect on this, we need to think about the justice that reaches the farthest places, how are women living this? What are their, their, their conditions and what do we need to do for women to have access? For me, it was a pleasure to be part of this facilitation of this panel. And I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your invitation. Thank you everyone. Thank you.
Muy bien, pues este panel de justicia de género, innovaciones e impunidad, and innovation and impunity, repensar, sar, 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 los procesos, los principios, los cimientos like de nuestros to... sistemas de justicia para garantizar el acceso a la justicia a las mujeres y a las personas con identidades feminizadas. Damos eh, las gracias a Fátima López, a Liliana Rieta, Michelle Reyes y a Rocío Villanueva por participar en este espacio. A continuación y como última actividad del, del, día, del primer día de este foro, tendremos el panel Calidad de la Justicia y Responsabilidad de las Instituciones. Este panel estará moderado por Gabriela Ortiz Quintero, directora de Java, programa de USAID, integrante de Fortis, 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 y participará en el workshop, coordinador del Centro de Calidad en México, que evalúa, Inés Elmul, responsable de la Oficina de Gobierno y Gobierno del Consejo de la Magistratura de la Ciudad de Buenos Aires, en Argentina, y coordinadora de la Red Internacional de Justicia Abierta. También estará Juan José Olvera, magistrado del Poder Judicial Federal de México, e Isabel Herreguerena, codirectora de X Justicia para las Mujeres de México. Adelante, Gabriel Ortiz. Adelante, Gabriela. The floor is yours, Gabriela. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank the organizing institutions uh, for the organization of such an important event of uh, justice innovation. As uh, it was uh, presented before, this is uh, table number six of this first uh, international, of the first um, day of this internal forum. This table is justice quality and institutions responsiveness. I am Gabriela Ortiz, and I'm going to be with you throughout this panel, and I'm going to be moderating this panel. And first of all, I would like to briefly present the biographies of those who are with us under this table. We have on the one hand, Enrico, Enrico Buscio, as it was said, he is a consultant of public policies, governance and institutional design and processes in security, criminal and civil justice, looking for the strengthening of institutions as well as the capacity transfer to civil servants and decision makers in Mexico and Latin America as well. With a security assistance program at USAIR, he has conducted a technical uh, consultancy to the prosecution offices in the assessment and improvement of performance through the building of governance processes and uh, institutional redesigning. With the Open Society uh, Justice Initiative, he has uh, built articulation, uh, political articulation models with uh, institutional communication strategies. Enrique studied uh, political science and public administration at the National uh, and the Autonomous National University of Mexico. Also with us, we have Ines Selwood, who has a master's degree in social communication by the University of Buenos Aires. She has a master's degree in journalism. Right now, he works on his uh, uh, thesis of human rights at uh, uh, the Catalonia University. Um, she has been working as a communication specialist for public management, and she is the head of Open Governance Unit of the City of Buenos Aires, where she developed Juice of Bidas, uh, which is uh, the, gov the open government. Starting from 2020, she is coordinating the international network of open justice. She was an advisor at uh, the agency. Uh, for access to public information 
since 2017 all the way up to 2019. In 2010, she helped uh, creating uh, the Office uh, for Access to Public um, Information, and then she was the head uh, thereof, among many other things. And well, she has a broad uh, experience uh, both uh, in uh, journalism and international organizations. And finally, Isabel Eregorena. She is with us uh, this afternoon and she has a bachelor's degree by uh, the Autonomous Institute of Mexico. She has a master's degree in international law with a specialization on human rights of the Washington College of Law of the American University. And she has a PhD in social anthropology by the Ibero-American University. She is the joint director of Justice for Women to promote access to justice for women. Before, within the same organization, she was the coordinator of public policies. Additionally, she has worked at other public administration institutions, such as the National Institute of Access to Public Information, the National Commission of Human Rights, and the Permanent Mission of Mexico of the United Nations. Likewise, she has held various uh, positions in several institutions in several fields, and she is Professor of International uh, Law and Human Rights at uh, La Salle University and Anahuac University. And also we have uh, Juan Jose Olvera. Uh, he has a bachelor's degree by uh, the Autonomous University of Georgia. He has a master's degree in criminal justice by the American University and a specialization in reasoning by the Alicante University in Spain. She is a judge of the federal judiciary and he has been a real leader in the implementation and the reform process of the adversarial system mixed and uh, uh, traditional uh, system and its uh, transition to the adversarial system. As you can see, we have a very diverse panel with uh, very diverse uh, careers and experiences. And I think that this is uh, going to enrich our discussion today a lot about uh, justice equality and institutions responsiveness. So I'm mean, to open our discussion. I will just uh, tell you about what we'll be discussing uh, during this table. We will be talking about tools, mechanisms, and uh, technologies uh, recommended by our panelists uh, to facilitate a high response capacity for institutions. And other further questions we will be making uh, to our panelists, and we hope that they will share their reflections with us throughout their presentations as to how to measure justice quality, how to measure progress in justice quality, and what conditions we have to comply with to favor a greater and a more accurate response by public institutions responsible for justice services and what the hurdles for these have been. I will just conclude here, and I'm going to give the floor now to our panelists. If there is something that uh, has not uh, moved uh, in at the same pace, is uh, the logic of the public policy cycle with uh, the planning that is made for public administration and justice administration. It's said that these dialogues are kind of uh, separate when we speak about accountability, assessment, quality measurement, and so on, as uh, assessing processes. Sometimes it seems that uh, these are very far away from uh, what is happening in uh, justice administration. And of course, in the last years, we have had, uh, we have seen many endeavors uh, to make progress in uh, this regard. With no further ado, I will ask uh, uh, Juan Jose to uh, use the floor that I once again greet 
and uh, welcome. Uh, H, uh, he will have 10 minutes for his presentation, just like the other panelists. So I respect. Uh, so I will ask you to uh, send your questions, uh, follow them for one Q and A uh, around. Um, the floor is your one. How so? Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Gabriela. Thank you, all of you with whom I have the pleasure to share this uh, reflection space through this uh, forum that Mexico Ebola is uh, leading. Uh, I greet uh, everyone who is following us on social media. My uh, presentation in this space will be around the creation of uh, justice quality indicators as a, a need that it cannot uh, be uh, put uh, off. My contributions will be made in this sense. I will start by saying that traditionally, it has been uh, said that justice is a guaranteed or its quality. And uh, this uh, first statement because of the minimum uh, jurisdiction requirements, impartiality, due process, and uh, appealing. Uh, those of us uh, who work in uh, public service, when we comply with uh, these uh, uh, process requirements, we can guarantee the quality of product of the product, which is a sentence. And that's the way we have assumed this historically. And a century ago, uh, this uh, premise uh, seemed to be correct because justice was being uh, made reasonably and uh, because uh, magistrates, we have a limited intervention. So we were solving a public or private uh, a criminal or civil uh, disputes, uh, but with the specific uh, um, contours with uh, marginal relevance or insight. However, towards 1950, with the uh, welfare state and then with the democratic state uh, and the rule of law, courts are not only uh, applying enforcing uh, current laws, however, and especially the constitutional jurisdiction will have been acknowledged the powers to make a law and the capacity to elaborate and even implement public policies. I think that in these conditions, uh, the 21st century, uh, century of justice is not just a matter of rule of law, but there is a power, an institutionalizing uh, power, because uh, you, can, you can create institutions. And in this way, because of uh, the extension of uh, the magistrate's uh, powers, as uh, Fix Fierro said, a paradoxical uh, process uh, is created for uh, the strengthening and uh, for concomitant strengthening and awakening in such a way that it has become a protagonist. And in this way, it is uh, a, a responsible uh, um, concomitantly uh, of uh, the jurisdictional processes trigger. And then uh, there is an engagement as well by the criteria, conflicting criteria that regulate the uh, things judged, uh, uh, although, and even for the most accepted uh, uh, juris, uh, illegal uh, uh, concepts such as freedom. In these times of uncontrolled insecurity, it's a uh, uh, common thought that uh, the judicial institutions that enforce uh, detention uh, laws uh, create impunity. Just to give you one of many examples that the magistrate is going to apply the rule of law rules and is going to assume the cost of considering uh, the way in which they are contributing to impunity by applying uh, the same uh, rule. So that's a reality. So there is awareness raising uh, around this. Uh, yes, and I think that uh, both the operators and the institutions governing the justice decisions have uh, become aware of uh, this of the relevance of this uh, protagonist position in uh, the building of uh, the rule of law every day and uh, it seems as well that uh, this is not considered into the dimension that we have to assume things, or at least that uh, awareness raising has not been reflected in the necessary actions to guarantee that justice is of quality, which is the most important thing we have. Well become aware is useless if we do not have the necessary uh, actions to build quality justice. For several decades now, we have been insisting on this topic. We have written a lot about this and we have debated about this a lot. And in uh, the legislative uh, uh, 
uh, at the legislative level in Mexico, we have the foundations for uh, this uh, aim, for instance, transparency, effective justice uh, through the mandate for magistrates, and uh, to privilege uh, the uh, solution of uh, uh, the context uh, instead of just a procedural, uh, instead of the application of uh, mere procedural laws, and finally, publicity of uh, adversarial system. These are values contributing, of course, to uh, generating and creating a quality justice setting. But the fact that justice is transparent helps identifying the virtues and defects of justice. But if this does not have any necessary measures at this uh, for these purposes, then we can see the effects, but not uh, the solutions. If we do not create uh, the mechanisms implementing uh, rules, awarding virtues and uh, punishing uh, defects, this scenario is uh, even more uh, adverse. Because today we know clearly uh, the quality of justice, but the necessary measures to improve it are not being implemented. It's the product of a prejudice to assume uh, the quality of processes and uh, the fact that uh, these aren't applicable to justice like for any other processes. And this is an idea that has uh, been the main uh, source of uh, uh, setbacks in the incorporation of uh, uh, the values of uh, quality production. Without a doubt, uh, uh, the judicial work and uh, our performance as magistrates is uh, Handicraft and age uh, court has its own components, which uh, makes it unique. But uh, the generic uh, and basic concepts are applicable to all of them. And I mean, uh, the production uh, means the principles. I will just mention some of uh, these that will allow me to materialize the idea that I want to develop here. Number one, the justice decision offers a product to a user. Uh, either this is a service, and uh, or this service is a public. Well, it's. Uh, uh, it, it, it generically it remains a product. Number two, justice quality must be measured in a relation to uh, the product and not the process. The user does uh, not care about uh, the process, but the result. A quality process uh, can lead to a quality product, but it cannot guarantee it. Uh, justice users will not see his right satisfied if. Uh, uh, even if a process has been followed exactly, if uh, in the end uh, the problem is not uh, fully solved. Today, uh, for a federal a federal justice in Mexico, we have and we think that uh, an entity works uh, well if uh, it solves uh, the same amount of uh, lawsuits that it is presented. If we have more than the ones it has, uh, the ones it has at the capacity to solve, it is performing uh, bad because it is not solving the same amount. But if we think uh, that uh, it's working properly, it's because it is. Um, solving the same number of losses. So we're not measuring whether the result is good or bad. It's good so long as uh, the opposite is uh, not uh, proved and uh, through the ordinary measure or through an administrative process of responsibility for the uh, for the magistrate. Let's say we have a high risk corpus sentence. Uh, instead of solving uh, the, 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 the core aspect, this is not solving the situation uh, to decide whether about uh, uh, the the uh, uh, the job position being held. So that's the reason with which federal justice operates in Mexico. Third idea, the product quality depends both on uh, the process quality and uh, on uh, the quality of the operator. Therefore, it has to be invested in uh, the capacity of operators as well as on the creation of uh, the, the tools to measure justice quality. Often, uh, we think that it's enough to have a good magistrate to guarantee quality justice, but an extraordinary magistrate without a, a basic platform can produce in bulk just uh, some extraordinary decisions, but uh, they cannot guarantee by system quality justice uh, for all of the users. Fourth idea. In the production, uh, in the justice production process, the operator is not the only one making a decision. 
is not the only one having an impact on their decision users as well, especially the technicians who contribute to uh, building the debate in such a way that it's necessary to introduce uh, quality justice uh, quality systems as well for professional uh, attorneys, those who represent final users at court uh, in uh, the search of justice. And finally, the action to quality uh, for mounting uh, the justice uh, quality uh, products. This is defined in relation to the values it adapts from the uh, legal system, but um, above all, and most importantly, for the solution of uh, disputes of the information and nurturing decisions. This uh, basic idea, I'm going to break it down into three ideas. Uh, first of all, empirical data are a necessary input for decision making in the building of uh, the machinery for the production of justice. We cannot implement a complete solution, a system solution, if we do not uh, build this from information being produced by the same uh, legal system. Theory is a uh, pivotal element, but without empirical information, uh, there is a risk of being offering a product that the user does not need. Quantitative data are a main input, but insufficient. We need qualitative data for information to be really useful. Uh, for the appropriate implementation of uh, uh, so the satisfying uh, the satisfaction indicators. And ex just to give you an example, in 2016, at uh, um, adversarial uh, system uh, court, we started to have sent back in terms of uh, the writing of the decisions, the federal government, uh, the first reaction considered to enable secret clicks uh, for uh, writing. After a small reflection, we implemented a supervision of the case and we saw that actually the problem was being caused because uh, the operator was considering to have uh, versions in writing of a uh, writing system, the one that we were leaving behind. Based to this problem, the solution which was implemented was that of uh, creating uh, guidelines of uh, short solutions uh, that uh, will not allow for privileging the the uh, the writing uh, system. We just have one minute. I'm sorry, uh, uh, Magistrate. Uh, yes, we think we thought about the solution, and well, we uh, thought about having new operators. What do I mean by this? What I'm saying with this is that uh, quality control processes and in relation with the products governing uh, industrial production are fully. Uh, in, uh, can be fully incorporated into the legal system. And today, when uh, those pr uh, justice production system have not been being have not been built yet, institutions are not acting response uh, with responsiveness. They do not have the capacity to uh, respond with a quality product. So they are not considering the quality of uh, a sentence or a judgment in relation to a, a result, which is the solution of the problem um, to its uh, cause. And just to start with the scheme, I would say the creation of uh, indicators of quality are necessary for this, which will add to those of uh, quantity. Necess which is a necessary condition to effectively respond to this demand of a public service. Thank you very much, Gabriela. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Judge. We'll have uh, another opportunity to have another intervention while we will be done with this first uh, round. And well, um, now I'm going to be uh, presenting and giving the floor to Ines Sel Selwood, uh, who is with us from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Ines, the floor is yours and welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriela. Thank you very much to the organizers of uh, this event. Congratulations for having been able to organize it with uh, in spite of all the constraints that we have been undergoing for almost two years, just like Gabriela said, uh, it's been less than two years that I have had the honor to coordinate the International Network for Open Justice. 
and uh, we were concerned about uh, making a uh, known and uh, to, uh, about connecting all of uh, the amazing experiences that are uh, taking place in the region in terms of open justice. I'm going to be speaking about this because, well, what uh, the judge was saying was really interesting. I'm happy that we uh, can agree here from uh, the uh, judicature, and uh, I can see that that. Uh, uh, this concerns uh, the topic of the panel in terms of uh, the open uh, justice proposals because I think that uh, these tools help to improve the equality of uh, uh, the justice officers. So I'm going to be sharing my screen with you a little bit and I'm going to tell you why I think that uh, open uh, justice in initiatives are uh, useful to increase uh, the justice service quality uh, with uh, good practice and standards which give uh, the judiciary the tools to uh, meet uh, the population's uh, demand the concept of uh, this concept comes from uh, another concept which was very famous in 2000 of open government then it became open state which concerned the three branches of uh, government and in here we had an opportunity to join to these uh, concepts that uh, had uh, been developed uh, then uh, justice adopts uh, the pillars of uh, the open uh, government uh, pillars and several initiatives uh, were there to streamline the system, the justice systems, and they focused on uh, planning and management. What uh, a judge was the judge was just saying in terms of the process, and not just in the final uh, product. Technologies were incorporated to these uh, processes. We worked a lot on a uh, judicial training, and uh, with uh, the technological incorporation. Also, we expedited uh, some uh, processes and we strive to look for uh, friendlier uh, responses for people interacting with uh, the justice service, sometimes just with the incorporation of an email or uh, some contact information and a voice behind a phone of a court. And I'm speaking here about general norms of what is uh, happening in Latin America but not just Argentina. So the pandemic uh, showed as well that this was uh, happening and we were missing a lot of interaction with the person interacting with the justice service, the livelihood of consulting courses online, the incorporation of technology was something that uh, we started incorporating uh, by uh, uh, giving uh, further transparency and this was related to the publication of information in open formats that were following international guidelines with uh, the generation of the publication of uh, jurisdictional information and here we focused uh, on the projects uh, in uh, itself and we were starting to see uh, air key areas to show what uh, uh, this was uh, making and uh, we started to see uh, this power which was always considered to be the most obscure ones and it was becoming more accountable uh, which is part of uh, the open uh, uh, government uh, initiative and then with the incorporation of innovations and technologies which is uh, across to all of uh, the open government uh, pillars well uh, we started to see in the public field, at the courts, uh, the judges, and we started to look for uh, collaboration opportunities with uh, the citizens in the decision-making processes. That is not just to communicate uh, unilaterally, but we wanted to make the data more transparent. We have to gather statistics about the processes that were being uh, conducted and we wanted to identify other initiatives to work in a coordinated way from within with all of the uh, branches of government and that's the key of uh, today's uh, topic which concerns uh, the jurisdictional work which was measured in its own processes when we're speaking about quality uh, uh, like the judge was saying, it's very important for us to understand that we have to look for um, 
measure their acting. Uh, we have to measure uh, products. And I would think that uh, we have a lot of uh, examples of Argentinian courts in this presentation, which are the ones that I had more in hand and which started to uh, communicate on social media from the pandemic. And we started to see the faces of uh, uh, justice, who they were, what they were doing. We started to see more data about what, what they were collecting. And this has not been registered up to uh, then. This was a way to make things transparent and of uh, uh, having a, a more uh, bi-directional communication for it to be really a collaboration and not just a, a one-way uh, not just a one-way communication not just one-way communication so in here we have the mechanisms all the way from Areha, the data portals uh, of uh, the judicial and legal systems and i think that uh, and the uh, judge uh, just uh, said it. I think that another of the questions which was proposed uh, for this panel, which concerns the conditions to be met to favor a greater response by uh, justice services, it's the acceptance of cultural change, which is uh, taking place. It's the incorporation of uh, participation mechanisms and listening mechanisms. And we have to continue with the process of measurement of management and all of uh, this in uh, these uh, continued uh, improvement uh, mechanisms that will increase the justice quality. And as it was being said before, the pandemic was an opportunity. Uh, when uh, technology was incorporated, uh, where it had been rejected before, let's say in some courts, um, isolation showed also that some things can be done, even if we, uh, 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 I mean, it would not only need to bring in writing the documents, but we could do this via email. And uh, this was also thanks to uh, the use of technology. So we can uh, promote this use uh, the participation thanks to the incorporation of technology to cover greater portions of the territory. The panel was also proposing to think about the conditions that had been an obstacle for this to uh, take place or for this to uh, move forward, to be advanced. And one, uh, how to was the lack of exercise to, uh, before the pandemic, this was already a problem. And now, uh, the judiciary has to start exercising this accountability mechanism, transparency, uh, quality measurement uh, for the service being made mechanisms. And also we uh, discovered that there were many isolated uh, cases and we're seeing uh, the champion, those who are uh, the avant-garde, which I have isolated cases here. And this uh, becomes uh, an institutional policy. We're going to have isolated initiatives here. In Argentina, we were always uh, discussing about uh, uh, the case of uh, the Buenos Aires uh, courts, and always uh, they were uh, participating in an isolated way. And the other day, I was uh, hearing that for one invention to stop being an invention and becomes an innovation, it has to reach all of uh, uh, the households. That means that we need an institutional reform. We need a deep reform of the judiciary. So these are not just isolated cases here and there. And uh, actually what can uh, uh, reach everyone and increase uh, the quality of the justice service. Enforcement or the implementation. If it doesn't reach that one, two, three, or four judges to publish information aleatoriamente or to measure, these judges said, for example, that they asked them what was the level of satisfaction of those who were going to the service of justice. They didn't know because they never had measured it. They didn't know if they were good or bad compared to what? Because they didn't have that data directly. So I think that. Eh, necesitamos un sistema que responda de manera transparente, participativa y creativa y que genere estos indicadores de calidad. Y también, como decíamos antes, la capacitación. Es necesario que eh, la capacitación sea permanente en todos los niveles y con un enfoque eh, multidisciplinario y de colaboración que apunte a generar estos procesos de co-creación que contábamos antes para poder potenciar el alcance y el beneficio de las políticas públicas que, que se proponen. ¿Sí? Para mí es, es central que 
se genere esto desde una reforma institucional y no solamente eh, de aquí y allá con casos aislados. Bueno, solo les quería comentar y los invitaba a sumarse a, a la Red Internacional de Justicia Abierta, que como les decía, se creó en pandemia, eh, por voluntad de personas que estamos trabajando en el tema de, de justicia, en diferentes poderes judiciales, organizaciones de la sociedad civil, la academia, en toda Latinoamérica, ya tenemos más de 200 miembros, eh, trabajamos en diferentes grupos de, temáticos, que nos parecen que son importantes para eh, apoyar las iniciativas de justicia. Aquí tenemos los miembros y les invito, a compartir, les invito a seguirnos en nuestras redes. Eh, son todos muy bienvenidos y bienvenidas. Y esa era toda mi eh, presentación. Muchísimas gracias, Inés. Sumamente interesante y me, bueno, creo que suma mucho lo que, como bien comentas, eh, el magistrado hablaba de cómo no solamente tener indicadores de, de calidad, sino esto de combinar calidad con, con cantidad. Y, y me parece como muy, muy interesante esto que comentaba sobre los aprendizajes de la pandemia y el uso de tecnologías, cómo pues sí han llevado a, pues, al desarrollo de nuevas prácticas en, en el tema de justicia. Te agradezco muchísimo y bueno, ya este, esperemos, esperamos escucharte ahora en la ronda de preguntas, respuestas y reflexiones. Y pues ahora toca el turno a Enrique Buchot, que quien nos acompaña también de, de México Evalúa y quien pues estará interviniendo hasta por 10 minutos. Adelante, Enrique. Muchas gracias, Gaby. Muchas gracias a todos los que nos siguen en el evento. Muchas gracias. Es un honor para mí estar con con este panel. Y bueno, pues creo que aquí en este panel tocamos lo que es importante, que es la calidad. Todo lo que hacemos, todas las innovaciones, todas las reingenierías, todas las modificaciones legales, al final se dan como una respuesta, eh, a, a, a una respuesta a la ciudadanía, una respuesta de, de Estado, de política, para mejorar la calidad. Eh, estas respuestas que se dan a través del rediseño de procesos, de reingenierías institucionales, de creación o desaparición de instituciones, modificaciones normativas, incremento de penas, ampliar el uso de la prisión preventiva en el caso de México, son respuestas que se dan a una demanda social de una mejor justicia. Y este es el quiz, justamente aquí es donde, donde debemos partir. ¿Qué se reforma? ¿Qué se cambia? Pues bueno, estamos reformando penas, estamos reformando eh, prisiones preventivas, estamos reformando procesos, pero sobre todo, y es la respuesta que, la pregunta que casi nunca se hace al plantear estas reformas es, ¿qué queremos lograr con estos cambios? Como lo mencionó el magistrado, pues eh, lo que importa a la ciudadanía al final es el resultado. Posiblemente los procesos sean cosas que nos interesen a los abogados o a las personas que nos interesan los procesos y estamos apasionados por la calidad y mejora del proceso. Pero al final, si esto no redunda en una mayor calidad, pues no, no se va a dar. Vemos al populismo penal surgir y encerrarse en el endurecimiento de las penas a una restricción de libertades, a incrementar los desequilibrios procesales o incrementar las asimetrías entre los operadores, mayores facultades a los fiscales, a las policías, a fin de favorecer a estas instituciones acusadoras. Pero no vemos que se respondan justamente estas pequeñas preguntas básicas. ¿Qué se cambia? ¿Por qué se cambia? ¿Qué queremos lograr? Y si no se responden o no se observa realmente una relación entre el cambio y el problema, pues la calidad no, 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 no va a incrementar. Y, y estaremos dando palos de, de tumbos de burro sin, sin, sin poder ver que la respuesta es bastante evidente. Eh, en el reporte que eh, publicamos hace unos días de hallazgos en México Evalúa, observamos, por ejemplo, que la asignación presupuestal a los diferentes operadores de un sistema que buscan objetivos homogéneos o el mismo objetivo no obedece ninguna lógica, ni siquiera la lógica inercial de un incremento o actualización presupuestal. Eh, no hay una definición de objetivos, hay unas variaciones erráticas año con año y así es muy difícil eh, establecer un, un esquema ya no de política pública, sino de, de un mínimo de calidad cuando no se permite la habilitación. Este, entonces, no sé si se pudiera presentar mi presentación, por favor, valga la expresión. Eh, a ver, voy a ver si puedo.
Ay, eh, ya no sé en qué pantalla estoy. Una disculpa, perdón. Sé que esto va sobre mi tiempo, así es que... Eh, creo que se ve la presentación, ¿verdad? Ya no, no yo ya los perdí. Bueno, eh, nosotros en México Evalúa hicimos una propuesta justamente para entender la calidad de la justicia. Eh, la calidad entendida no en la sentencia, porque la sentencia al final es solo un resultado y un compilado de todo lo que pasa, sino la justicia como un sistema de interacciones que se dan entre diferentes operadores, en el caso de la justicia penal, entre defensa, víctimas, eh, eh, el ministerio público, jueces, etc. Eh, entonces, eh, las siguientes, por favor. Ya no, ya no sé quién. Ah. Entonces, los objetivos que nosotros en México Evalúa tenemos al, al, al analizar la calidad, pues es entender la operación del sistema de justicia eh, procesal acusatorio, evaluar los modelos de gestión, detectar las áreas de oportunidad que deben ser atendidas, así como sistematizar las buenas prácticas que se pueden dar y fomentar su replicación, analizar el nivel de cumplimiento de los principios del sistema de justicia penal y analizar la calidad del desempeño por operadores. La siguiente, por favor. Nosotros tenemos pues una lógica sistémica porque al final de cuentas la justicia no reposa sobre los hombros o sobre el actuar de una sola de las instituciones y entonces eh, nos interesa entender primero el comportamiento de los operadores por aislado, sus interacciones y cómo este comportamiento se va desarrollando y estas interacciones se van entretejiendo en el, cada, en el desarrollo de cada etapa procesal, porque tampoco podemos hablar de una calidad homogénea, cada, cada etapa tiene sus retos para los diferentes operadores. Y al final esto nos va a dar con un, un, un nivel de calidad de cumplimiento de principios, de derechos, de las reglas. La siguiente, por favor. Y bueno. ¿Qué buscamos, la, eh, eh, ¿Qué buscamos observar? Bueno, nuestra metodología eh, busca observar el flujo del proceso en los procesos ya judiciales, eh, las interacciones que se van dando entre los actores, los nodos decisorios y qué resultados se están dando, tanto por operador como por etapa, y al final esto tendrá una consecuencia en el resultado total. La siguiente, por favor. Eh, nosotros, a partir del seguimiento del... del del flujo del proceso, desarrollamos una serie de indicadores que nos muestran las acciones que son deseables que se desarrollen durante la etapa y los estándares que son los atributos que asociamos a cada indicador que ya nos van dando matices de calidad. Eh, digo, voy a intentar irme, eh, es una metodología compleja y muy interesante que pueden ustedes consultar en nuestra página. La siguiente, por favor. Ah, es que no me, es muy poco el tiempo para explicarle en 10 minutos. Un ejemplo de los resultados que se pueden observar es en las diferentes dimensiones de las audiencias podemos ver eh, protección de derechos, las igualdades procesales, la fundamentación, el control de la audiencia, la claridad de la exposición, la precisión de datos, la calidad de la argumentación, la contradicción asociado a diferentes valores. Y entonces podemos ver que en esta audiencia intermedia pues hay una importante área de oportunidad en la contradicción, eh, principalmente en el agente del Ministerio Público, aunque la defensa tampoco es... La, la, más, la, más este, la mejor calificada y justamente este punto de contradicción en una audiencia intermedia es, el núcleo, es uno de los núcleos del proceso donde se están contradiciendo, se están debatiendo los, los medios de prueba que se van a presentar. Eh, en la siguiente, por favor. En base a esto, pues se pueden ver exactamente los indicadores muy puntuales que, que, que dieron eh, estos, estas calificaciones como la falta de argumentación lógica como la falta de eh, cuestionamiento a las, a las diferentes, a, a, a la contraparte. Y nos permite entonces identificar buenas prácticas y malas prácticas a fin de poder ya hacer eh, intervenciones muy puntuales para mejorar la calidad, como pudiera ser eh, una buena práctica, pues es que la, los agentes del Ministerio Público durante las etapas iniciales tienen muy bien establecida la estructura de sus planteamientos y no dependen tanto de la oralidad. En cambio, en las malas prácticas, tanto de la defensa como del Ministerio Público, es que ya en la etapa de juicio dependen muchísimo de sus escritos. Esto tiene como consecuencia que no haya una contradicción, sino que cada uno se atenga a su escrito y no cuestione los planteamientos del otro. Eh, la siguiente, por favor. 
Entonces, ¿qué nos permite ver? Pues nos permite ver eh, tanto un panorama amplio de todo el proceso como acciones muy concretas por operador, como, eh, eh, como etapas muy específicas. A nosotros nos interesó, también nos permite ver aspectos puntuales, a nosotros nos interesó entender eh, cómo se viven las víctimas o cómo se trata a las víctimas durante el proceso y también eh, ciertos enfoques de género. Entonces, a, al hacer la observación de las audiencias, eh, se pueden también seccionar eh, hallazgos importantes sobre temas de interés, ya sea personales, institucionales o de coyuntura política. Eh, y bueno, la siguiente, por favor. Esto nos permite evaluar eh, eh, emitir recomendaciones muy específicas, eh, evaluarse las resoluciones en cuanto al cumplimiento eh, que van más allá de la pena privativa de la libertad, eh, incorporar actos que pueden tener un impacto de calidad en la calidad del proceso, como los cambios de operadores, que esto rara vez se evalúa dentro de la calidad de un proceso y tiene alto impacto en la inmediación o en la defensa. Difundir la importancia de que las partes acudan a las audiencias de lectura de sentencia, ya que las personas, que los representados no suelen eh, entender sus alcances o su contenido. Eh, bueno, aquí dejo a, a, la presentación, la podemos cortar un segundo y voy a ocupar los 30 segundos para explicar que también tenemos un observatorio de resoluciones de calidad que analiza eh, eh, de, después de observado todo este proceso, cómo se está construyendo la, la sentencia o las resoluciones. Si estas están obedeciendo a los principios de protección de los derechos, de protección de las vulnerabilidades y eficiencia del, de, de, del proceso. Entonces, este micro zoom que hacemos sobre audiencias en específico, casos en específico, con acciones en específico, nos permite tener una noción más de la calidad y entonces ya establecer los resultados hacia dónde queremos llegar. No solo es mejorar la calidad en, en grosso, sino mejorar la capacitación. No es vamos a capacitar, esto de vamos a capacitar es la solución más básica que no, no nos lleva a ningún lado. Vamos a capacitar en temas de reparación de daño, en temas de solicitud de medidas cautelares. Este, bueno, ya me pasé 20 segundos, aquí le corto. Muchísimas gracias. Enrique, muchísimas gracias por, por tu intervención y también pues por, por la puntualidad en, en, en concluir con la misma. Y bueno, pues eh, ahora toca dar el turno a Isabel Herrera quien nos acompaña de X Justicia para Mujeres. Y pues adelante Isabel, gracias por acompañarnos. Muchas gracias Gaby. Muchas gracias a, a, a México Evalúa por esta invitación. Y pues la verdad es que ha sido un panel de, de lujo porque toca muchos de los temas que desde X venimos trabajando y que hemos trabajado algunos de la, en, de la mano de México Evalúa. Un poquito para poner en contexto eh, quién es X, X es una organización eh, que busca el acceso a la justicia eh, de las mujeres, pero de todas las mujeres. ¿Qué queremos decir con esto? Es el acceso al sistema de justicia sin discriminación y con servicios satisfactorios, disponibles, accesibles, adaptables y de calidad. Y que también haya una concientización social de los derechos de las mujeres, de las obligaciones del Estado en la materia y de las condiciones estructurales que afectan el acceso a la justicia. Y entendemos que el acceso a la justicia es la garantía indispensable para el libre ejercicio de los derechos reconocidos en, la, en las leyes y la Constitución y los tratados. Dicho esto, desde que X empezó a hacer su trabajo, eh, queríamos medir qué hacía el Poder Judicial. Y lo más lógico, se nos hizo un poco lo que platicaba el magistrado y, y un poco de la línea de lo que decía Enrique, eh, Dijimos, bueno, lo, hay que hacer un observatorio de sentencias, ¿no? Y pues lo primero que nos topamos es que las sentencias no eran públicas. ¿Por qué? Porque la Ley General de Transparencia establecía que únicamente eh, las sentencias eh, de interés público eh, eran las que debían ser públicas. ¿Esto qué pasa? 
que aunque hay una serie de criterios, la mayoría de los estados deciden qué es de interés público y encontramos casos como en el de Zacatecas, que por dos años decidió no hacer ninguna sentencia por, pública por no considerarla como tal. Entonces empezamos una larga labor que incluyó llevar esto a, a, nación, a órganos de Naciones Unidas, al Comité contra la Discriminación contra la Mujer, al Comité contra la Discriminación Racial y por primera vez logramos vincular la apertura del Poder Judicial con el ejercicio de derechos y se establecieron recomendaciones en el sentido de que se tenía que cambiar esta ley. Dicho esto, eh, la, esta ley fue, fue cambiada, el Congreso después de estas recomendaciones decidió cambiar y ahora se acaba de terminar el plazo y están por publicarse las sentencias y además también eh, todo esto lo hicimos, eh, ya también metimos eh, una un litigio estratégico con la Red por la Ciudadanización de la Justicia, donde solicitamos eh, que eh, se declarara que todas las sentencias fueran públicas. La Suprema Corte declaró que sí, que sí debían de ser públicas bajo tres argumentos que creo que es muy importante decirlos. El primero es que era una forma de los, para los ciudadanos de conocer sus derechos porque era la interpretación de ellos como tal que además era una forma de rendición de cuentas de los, de los jueces y también de legitimidad de los jueces. Esta sentencia es histórica y nos invita a aperturar. Entonces nos preguntamos ¿qué sigue? Eh, ¿Qué sigue después de que las sentencias sean públicas y que las vamos a analizar como tal? Eh, y entonces las lanzamos, y déjame decirte Inés que ustedes fueron una gran eh, inspiración para el trabajo que, que sacamos, el pacto por una justicia abierta con perspectiva de género. Este pacto apenas lo lanzamos el 28 de septiembre eh, con la idea... Eh, On September 28, with the idea, we launched it in X Justice for Women as an articulator with the Mexican Society of Justice and organizations such as Ibero, CIDE, and Tec de Monterrey. And we have more than 40 ally organizations in order to do a follow up to this pact that is trying to put on the core of this the historically discriminated groups with a series of indicators. We had been developing a series of indicators in our report of open justice, but we updated these indicators and I'm going to share my screen in a moment. But I wanted to say that this agreement, opposite to other exercises, is focused on non-discrimination and equality. And I think that makes it something new in Latin America. And if we decide to be part of the network, without a question, Argentina is an example, as well as Costa Rica, of open justice. These are the indicators that we generate for this pact. The first one is the generation of useful and accessible statistics. And here we can see the generation of information on cases, entered cases, also the information on issued rulings, the generation on restraining orders. And in Mexico, we talk about feminicides, but we do not talk about what we do to prevent them. And also the generation of statistics on the training of the staff, and also the generation of statistical information on the jurisdiction staff. Also the adoption of citizen participation mechanisms. Now we are about to do the update of the report, but I can tell you that we have given a step back 
and also the judicial training with indicators for impact assessment because training itself is not considered well it's very dangerous there is a very famous case in mexico which is the case of the group called los porquis where the judge decided to give to to allow a, per, a man who to be in freedom they had raped a woman because they said that she had enjoyed these rapes. So it's not enough to train if we do not have indicators that measure the impact. On the strengthening of transparency units as well, because many times these transparency units are only one people, one person that have a specific budget and they need to have enough staff. And also, proactive transparency policies, such as establishing criteria for the publication of information based on gender, to spread the rulings, to publish public interest information, and to make these rulings based on the citizenship that are more accessible. Also, the publication of these judicial decisions, which is also a, a, an obligation, and what Inés was saying about digital justice that is being developed right now in the pandemic. And we are aware, aware that digital justice has not reached all the population. So we also include innovative practices. So what is the plan on this? We have eight judiciaries that are on this plan. We are going to give them the form for they to fill in this information in a simple manner. And since we know that we are a centralized organization that is in Mexico City, within the organizations, we have at least two of every state of the country so that they can also give their own information of what the judiciary is giving them and also support and do what we know as the mapping of the open justice, where we are going to be uploading all the information for it to be public. This is going to be a two-year plan with different stages that has periodical reports. And the idea is, as Inés mentioned, to understand that this accountability of the judiciary with the citizenship the strengthens it and helps us to know the quality of the justice that is that it's providing and also to improve it and i think i have four seconds left so i'm done isabel thank you very much for your intervention it was very interesting and also for finishing on time. And just to finish, uh, well, it's not to finish this panel, but to continue with this reflection and to do a second round, if you allow me, a second round that would be the last round of intervention by each of you. And I would give you up to three minutes, if you agree, for each of you to do another intervention. And on the one hand, I would like you to give us a final reflection on what has been said here or what you have heard here. And there is also a very specific question for each of you. So if I may, I will start with Judge Juan Jose Olvera. I will ask him a question. And I would also ask him to share a final reflection up to three minutes. And my question is very specifically, just a second, please. I have it here. It's about what do you consider to be the most favorable conditions in the institutions to achieve or to make them more responsive? What do you consider to be the most favorable elements for this? And 
maybe also a final remark on everything. Of course, Gabriela, thank you very much. This is a question that is very good for me because I have been thinking about it for a really long time since I had the responsibility of working in the implementation of the criminal reforms. These were a content, constant. What are the favorable conditions for the government of the judges to act with responsibility? For me, it's awareness. It means assuming that the target of all the operational rules is the user and not the, the one that is giving the service. To think about the citizen when establishing the rules of this justice provision and not think about the operators. Operators are part of the process and we have said that our job is so bad that they pay us to do it and we are being paid to provide a service. So we may think that why are rules being accommodated to us and not for the people asking for the service? So I think that creating this awareness is the starting point. And it's only the start point because creating the rules that favor the service for the users is not easy. This is a very complex topic, but if we start by assuming that it's possible to incorporate to this justice provision process, the values of the industrial processes, uh, of course, by modeling them to this area, I think that we would be on the right road. And as Ines, Ines said, we are on the road, but only on the road, not on the final destination, because the final destination sometimes seems that we cannot reach it, but we cannot stop walking towards it. So I think that's the key. That's just a basic example in order to show you this idea. When we talk about the criminal justice system and how we optimize the use of physical spaces for, for it, the response to be easier for the user, so within the two possible alternatives, we consider that the distribution of workloads for the public officer towards the user is a relationship of a judge with the hearing. This means that the judge is going to be in the hearing and only the judge that is available at that moment is going to go to that hearing. And the other possibility is judge and cost, that based on the whole file, the user would have to adapt to the agenda of the judge that is available and an expert in their matter. So for instance, as when we talk about a medical service. So in this regard, we prefer to start with the rule of the judge and the hearing. I am the user, it's the morning and I'm going to have the judge that is available and that's it. The other rule is I go to the justice service when the judge that is an expert in my issue tells me that they are available. So these are the rules in a general way in the whole scheme. And it was more efficient from the user part to have this rule of the judge hearing. Of course, we started with that and there was a natural issue here because of the operator. And they said, I will, I need to be based, basing on the, uh, on the, on the user's agenda. And this rule was not good for the judge and there was a permanent resistance. They worked a lot on that. And throughout the years, the product was not satis satisfactory and the ruling of the judges before this in satisfactory service was like that. So the rule gave priority to, to the interest of the user, or maybe I will give priority to, to the judge. And the solution was not to do this rule, but going back to the rule of the traditional system. And right now the criminal justice system in these centers is working on the traditional justice system, which is the judge and cause. And this is being translated in taking really a longer time in the process. 
because right now we are giving priority to the judge of the case to be available. And we know different cases from the last two or three weeks in Mexico that we cannot have a hearing because the judge was busy, the judge of that case. I think that this gives us the context of the idea that it's very complex to create quality indicators. And yes, it's complex, but we also need to be aware that these cannot be done if we are based on the duty of creating quality justice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Judge. And I think that, um, well, if we uh, try to summarize in a sentence what you are sharing with us uh, in the end, um, and if I am not mistaken, and it was mentioning at this, the uh, cultural change is pivotal change of this uh, paradigm, the change of uh, this idea to see the justice system uses as the users that they are as uh, beneficiaries of a service and of a service that has to be measured uh, in the end uh, with regards to uh, the quality, uh, the service itself, and the several aspects that we can uh, find in other um, uh, fields uh, like uh, uh, business, uh, industrial, uh, where we have this vision uh, very clear. And uh, finally, I uh, agree uh, with, the, the, with the idea that one of these elements concerns a lot uh, the culture, the cultural changes uh, for the institutionalization and the institutionality of uh, uh, some uh, processes and ways to uh, do this uh, every day. Thank you very much. And uh, it was a pleasure uh, to uh, be with you in this space. And, and now I would like to ask uh, Ines. And above all, since Isa mentioned uh, this, how, well, I think in Argentina, not just in this topic, but in several other topics, uh, we have had an important uh, reference uh, for Mexico in several uh, topics in matters of uh, justice. But I would like to ask uh, Ines how we uh, associate uh, these indicators that can uh, be um, internal and how we can have uh, enhancement. How can we have a dialogue between uh, these internal assessments and the ones uh, being made from external observatories and uh, how this uh, can permeate I'm not sure if I am saying this appropriately, but in a formal way or in a serious way, in the institutional transformations and a final reflection, if it's not too much, in these last minutes. Thank you very much, Gabriela. Actually, in Argentina, we look up to Mexico in many topics concerning data openness, access to public information, transparency. We follow closely uh, uh, the case of uh, sentence uh, publication. And I think that uh, this has uh, been a very a, a good example of institutionalization and of this way to speak um, uh, from within out because we found a problem. And how come uh, the sentences were not public? Who was it, who was deciding what was the public interest? So we addressed the institution and we were able to reform a law. Like the, it was a perfect path if it were had not taken so long, but that would be the right way. And uh, uh, the final reflection as not to uh, take much time with having uh, justice, uh, uh, which is... Uh, people-centered, and when we, when we say people, we mean we have this Western idea of uh, a, a white person, a white man uh, who, uh, in a suit who go to court, and, and now we have, uh, so we can uh, think uh, of uh, people uh, uh, sent uh, to justice. We have to know that everyone exists. We have to have a further representation of uh, women of uh, different uh, groups which aren't represented today in uh, decision-making. And uh, when we will have a further dialogue between uh, those, who are at their judicial institutions and those who are really the beneficiaries of the justice service, 
but surely we will find more of uh, these uh, problems and we will have uh, we'll be able to discuss them and solve them and uh, reach a favorable conclusion uh, exactly for those who have to access uh, this uh, justice service so that would be my final reflection thank you very much for this i will stay here discussing about this for hours it's very interesting but thank you very much for the invitation Ines, thank you very much and greetings and well uh, hugs all the way uh, down to Argentina and thank you for sharing with us and for joining and when we speak about innovations and technology use it's really amazing that in uh, this time uh, on uh, platforms like this one we can uh, connect uh, uh, from north to south in the region. Uh, thank you very much for your intervention. And uh, well, likewise, I will uh, ask Enrique. I know him, uh, I know his uh, career very closely, so maybe I'm going to be too friendly with him. And uh, well, he is. Uh, monitoring daily the uh, local and federal uh, uh, Mexican judiciary institutions. My question is, with regards to our topic, have you identified any good practices uh, for institutional enhancements or their responsiveness in the context of the pandemic. It's been some months now that uh, we have uh, been uh, locked down and using virtual means. We were speaking about the possible uh, collapse or not of justice, and uh, not just uh, in terms of uh, virtual hearings and in Argentina. I have been following closely the development of these. And in terms of accountability and transparency, something that the pandemic uh, left us besides many hours on Zoom. Thank you very much, Zoom. No worries, you can be as friendly as uh, you want uh, with me with regards with regards uh, to my career. I think this is a very good question. At uh, this table, we have addressed responsiveness as uh, the response uh, capacity by institutions that have to focus on citizens and uh, uh, people user. We have to stop understanding justice as uh, a state function in an abstract way and see it as a basic service like uh, uh, water provision, uh, power supply, rubbish collection, and only in this way we will start improving, just like the judge was saying, based on uh, results. What are the results? I don't know the rubbish collection process. I only know that when I take my rubbish bin out uh, and I have the separation, once I go back, it won't be that. That's how I will uh, rate quality. The rest is just uh, getting there. And it's necessary to understand that we must not conduct an assessment as civil societies. It has been the case. The design of indicators is not only those of us that we have our interests, and it's important to have information and to open information that we need because justice in the end is a business where we have civil society citizens and it, we are all interested in it and also the, the authorities. But authorities can still have uh, uh, their observatories and develop their own indicators in terms of quality. In S. Isabel, myself, makes a bit of value. We have our interests and we cannot address it all. Having said this with regards to the response capacity by the state coming from observation itself in terms of where we want to get, get practices with regards to what the pandemic was the pandemic was living in the federal the mexican federal state of coelho we have a very quick and expeditious 
participants in a country like us in which we have very uh, few urban areas and many rural areas it's pivotal to start moving towards virtual uh, just administration mechanisms like uh, this federal service doing this when the pandemic uh, uh, broke i have and in here the interest is of the capacity of the prosecutor offices to establish uh, these mechanisms so uh, loss of filing is easier but and it should be easier uh, but it's not the case really it does not matter any innovations because if uh, filing is difficult, there is a problem of connection between the parties and the prosecutor office can see many things, but sometimes the defense is isolated because of these asymmetries. Relevance is the most important thing because our observation activities could only take place uh, because of the uh, because of these mechanic because of the videos that we were sent because they understood then that it was not us up to us to go and be there on site but to receive this information that's all thank you thank you enrique as i was saying before as you feel the pulse every day of these topics maybe if these aren't the innovations this can be learnings, or at least we can identify these bridges and say, hey, the pandemic is here, and I'm sorry, but it was a surprise. And uh, how really see that there were institutions and there were operators uh, who had uh, the capacity to connect directly, downloading a, a Zoom and send emails. But the truth is that we can also find locally operators that uh, are still struggling to find uh, a computer uh, so i hope that uh, these uh, um, identified breaches or identifiable can uh, generate uh, mechanisms or strategies to add to the institution's responsiveness thank you very much enrique and isa from uh, feminism, from the feminism. And the work through many feminists interested in justice. How have uh, been uh, the bridge, the gaps been identified and how, how we try to resignify this paradigm in terms of uh, justice and uh, they're responsible for it. In this was speaking about this, we believe that uh, uh, justice is uh, a straight wine man. But if uh, uh, we not only can see the operators but users as well, we will involve gender perspective and uh, the cross nature the diverse nature that justice must to have. The question is, after all of this that I have been saying, where is the answer? Where can we find the best ways, the best routes to change these paradigms in users? and people seeking justice so for this concerns training control uh, results control process is streamlining where can we find uh, the best uh, starting point i'm sorry i spoke a lot uh, for the question but that was my question thank you isa and a pleasure and an honor to share with you this space Likewise, Gambi, we had a forum where we discussed uh, the judicial reform. Stefania Donella said something which is basic for me. Feminists, we study how to exercise power and the judicial power uh, and the judiciary is a power, a branch. For me, feminists, we have to take the judiciary as a 
as one of our main agendas. Because in the end, this is what gives us access to more rights. How can we do this in a cross way? I'm a very concerned when we try to place women in bubbles. It only we're only affected by what sexual or reproductive nature only uh, care. No, we are affected by everything. Right now, when we are discussing about the new minister that I, and well, we just have this, uh, we just received the information a, a couple of minutes ago. Representation matters, but also in the, uh, this uh, administration, we learned that uh, it must not just be a woman, but a woman uh, with a feminist uh, anti punitive agenda, if I resume what my colleagues were saying. So um, I think it's in every of the factors that the judiciary has. And we have to incorporate here a uh, intersectoral gender perspective. Feminists, we have to be everywhere. And the judiciary is no exception to this. That would be my answer. Thank you very much, Isa. Yes, as you were saying, from the analysis, I can cite uh, Fanny Avera. If we analyze the judiciary, and from here we can see where many gaps uh, exist, many vertical relationships that have to transform in uh, everyday uh, life. And again, uh, I'm going to conclude like this, uh, this table. But I want to resume what the judge was saying as a moment ago. How can we think that users don't want the process, but the product, the result when they are going to ask for justice. But how, as you were saying, is that each one of uh, those people uh, were here from the moment they have interests, needs, and uh, very different experiences when um, they approach institutions. And well, thank you very much uh, uh, for your time, for your contributions, your generosity. As I said at the beginning, what uh, better than to have uh, uh, these uh, myriad of experiences from different uh, geographies and all of which are uh, aimed at the improvement of the institutions and uh, their responsiveness. Thank you very much, Juan Jose, Enrique, Ines, Isabel, uh, for, being, for having been uh, with us today. And thank you very much to the organizing institutions for making uh, uh, such a relevant and important event of reality. And I greet all of you who were with us this afternoon at this table. Thank you very much.